second thing Kim said to me this morning was, I know you're not a morning person. <laughs> so I'm going to start with sorrow and poets. This is a little poem called Rue for A. the fact that he fell in love once and that his love married and moved to India and died. Who for A. Housen? To have one love for all of your life and it as dear as breath. To lose the shape of what you loved in distance, then in death. Yes, what a funny world it is. Where this is not the worst that can happen and daily does. The mouth that did not thirst for yours is dust, and you are not. Yet heedless of all doom, the children shout immortal joys. Again, the roses bloom. Okay, another poet, another sorrow. Let's see. Billy Collins. <laughs> Billy Collins was impertinent enough to take off Emily Dickinson's clothes. <laughs> I didn't like that he didn't like her reticence. I didn't like that he didn't like her modesty. But he was very impertinent, and so I wrote a fire in ice. Don't think because her words are wild that Dickinson's a sylphine child for your undressings. Don't rin the haze of veils that shields you from her blaze. Her hands are capable and know the ways of burning, how sparks blow. When flames are jostled by a bold adept, her fingers tipped with cold. And though in after hours she threads the dew she plucks from spider webs, or answers who to midnight's owls, or strokes the cats returned from prowls, or takes to skipping to and fro with moonlit maidens made of snow, she'll freeze inviolate and meek if you so much as try to speak. Shell off. Avoid those brazen wings. She's not for your unbuttonings. The polished stone above her head declares her state among the dead. Here waits that sphinx whose secret power in riddles found her finest flower. little one for us all when we're wanting to write poems and not writing poems. So it's that poem that you write when you can't write a poem. Self-portrait is dryad number two. I should say that to follow it more easily, the moon turns into a fortune teller's wall here. November she is a silvery gray torment, moon snagged in her claws. A fortune teller's ball hurled angrily at night. Snare held, asked of glass, declares, snarl of twigs, the dead wood next to your heart, cracks for telling fall. No worry. Your root taps through stone to the fire core. Your net captures cloud. The muse, merciless boy, will run to you in spring. He'll call for poems and willy-nilly whistle for flower and fruit till you're wrapped with bloom. Because we always love what we're working on now, I'm going to read some new poems from a series I've been writing about the figures of the Red King and the Fool. These have all been in Mezzo Camino or Little Bean. The first one, the Fool enters the Red King city. The Starry Fool. In a shivering of bells, the fool comes shining, shimmering, unseen along the moonshine way. Little fir trees sprinkle his path with needles, lift their limbs and point to the bright whirligigs of stars, and the crack in the fool's heart is for once mended, as if without a seam. He shakes his bell branch staff at the stars. So cold, no one plays the watchman. But in the tower called the Spear, the Red King rules the chiming hour. There he will spy the moon-washed fool, skittling like a toy top through the city. He will run outside to greet him, 
Polly, my brother and myself, my mirror, the crack inside my heart. In this one, the fool and the red king each give the other a kind of present. It's called the two tables. The king sets a table for the fool, arranging the cloth and the whittle spool that's wound with gilt and silver thread, a wheel of cheese with twisted bread, the cup that holds a glowing star, the feather that tumbled from a far fetched place above the walls of the world, a flower of ice, the petals furled, a wine that came some thousand miles from the floating fortunate isles. The fool sets table for the king with pens and ragged skittle string, with glossy feathers of a crow, tumblers spilling dust hearted snow, a cup of tears a glass of rain, a mug that chambers childish pain, a stick with bells, a fool's peaked cap, a sea, a precious winter trap that jails so beautifully the sea of pulse and whispered mystery. The Fool's Confession. When the fool confesses to the priest, the world reels on its axis and a gust a blackened leaves and feathers tears the field to flowery bits while babies shriek for milk and sanity inside a raven gloom that's ravenous for blood, sinews, and bone, and knows no motherings or ship of friends or golden rings that vow a faithful love. When the fool is dry and empty as a gourd, unknowing everything except one thing, a dream begins to fill the bowl of head. A wordless word, a sluice of fiery rain, a sweetness that is hurt, made flowering. He staggers from the place, his eyes so wide, that everything is rainbow-rich like gems. And in the common square, on common grass, a single, simple tree is burning red. to read a couple poems from a book called The Foliate Head that will be out sometime. And the first one I wrote for the man who did the painting on the cover of my new book, The Throne of Psyche. I was just in Wales to um, help launch two books associated with his retrospective. And I wrote this poem for him. He's a painter now, but he used to be an actor. And he started professionally when he was 13. And one of the parts he played was Puck. And I use the, the form that you find in Puck's address at the, at the uh, end of Midsummer Night's Dream. It's a spring waking up poem, so good morning poem. Puck in Spring. Now the catamount will scream, now the bears awake from dream, that the winter's night prolongs till the ice dissolves in songs. Now the daybreak fires the mist by the mountain ridges kissed, while the crocus blossoms yield, opening along the field. Now it is the hour in spring when the jetting sap will bring fresh desire to boy and girl, waking to a brighter world. And the fairies hunting shade, finding meadow grass arrayed with the bloom of early bells, creep inside the fragrant cells. Now in clearing vale and slope, all the land is drunk with hope. In the ancient greening wheel, now is loosed what once was sealed. Why, the very mountains reel at the turning of the wheel. Okay, I'll end with a goodbye poem. This will be the last poem in the folio pen. The Goodbye. Goodbye, my borrowed bits of loveliness, you necklaces of pomegranate seeds, you leaf green shadows clustered in a gem, you priceless pearl, redeemer of the dust. Goodbye to my dear husband, children, friends, for something wilding calls my secret name, and light and forest overshadow me. Already beams that slant between the bowls, 
go sliding through my skin until I shine, and white-eyed vireos have plucked at leaves to build my nest among sycamores. I wander emerald woods until I tire, pursuing still some moving goal in dreams. I sleep in leaves beside an anchored sea. The greeny shadows in this land of peace are patterned with rain that brings a scent of earth. The droplets rise again as cloud, foretelling metamorphosis in me. Thank you.